Good morning, church. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Welcome to worship here at Hawkinsville First United Methodist Church. My name is Jack Varnell, and I am the pastor here. And first off today, I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers watching this morning. We love you, and we hope that you have a wonderful day just being celebrated for how awesome that you are, and you deserve every single bit of it. And second, thank you to everyone else who's watching this morning. Uh, wherever you're watching from, we are grateful to have you with us here today. And I invite you to take a moment to say hello in the comment section so that we can see who all is worshiping with us and so we can say hello back to you. Um, I like to say that our church has a mission. And our mission is to worship Jesus and we grow in our holiness and then we go to serve the world. And that mission continues this morning, wherever you're watching from, as we ask God to continue to make us into his people this morning. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Holy God, you are good and you are faithful. And you are true to your word, you are true to your promises. And we humbly come before you this morning seeking a word from you. We come seeking your presence and give us what we most need today. Give us your blessing and your power in this time, for we are here for you. We are ready to meet with you, and we rest in your amazing grace and your love this morning. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Well, every week in church, we have this amazing opportunity to join in the tradition of the Apostles' Creed. And this helps to connect our story with Christians all across the world and all throughout history. That's a pretty amazing thing, isn't it? And I invite us to continue in that tradition this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. Well, I invite you now to join me in a moment of silent prayer where I invite us to, to give thanks for all of our mothers and all of the mother figures in our lives who have played such a big role for us. And then I'll begin the morning prayer and then we'll all uh, join together in the Lord's Prayer this morning. Let us pray at this time. Heavenly Father, today is the day where we remember mothers. And we know that mothers come in many different forms, and today we celebrate them all. We celebrate their love and their care and their commitment. We celebrate all the work that you do in and through the mothers in our lives. We thank you for our mothers and all that they have poured out into us. We thank you for those mothers who have already joined you in heaven and whom we miss dearly on this earth. We are grateful that you have them in your hand, and we look forward to that day when we will be with them again. We thank you for every mother who is working day and night to raise her children the right way right now. We thank you for the soon-to-be mothers and the blessing they are going to be in raising their children. We thank you for the single mothers who are stronger than they even know. We thank you for the mothers who took on the role through adoption and foster care. We thank you for the witness of mothers who have lost a child and have been able to carry on by your power. We thank you for those who desperately wanted to have children of their own, but instead became as a mother to so many others around them. We thank you, Lord, for all the mothers and the women who have influenced our lives in so many ways. And we pray that we will honor them in all that we do every single day. And as we move forward in worship today, we pray that you will speak to all of us. As you inspire the writing of your holy word, inspire the reading and the proclamation of your word this morning. Help us to hear from you as you speak to us. Help us to be open to what you want to say to us. And help us to be ready to move and to act in response to your word. We are truly blessed to have this time of worship, and we humbly give you our lives this day. And we pray that you will take them and make them yours. Send us out to be your people this week. Send us out to love and to serve. Send us out to bring your special blessing upon everyone that we can this week. We make this prayer in Jesus' name as we pray now together the great prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, thank you to so many of you who have continued your tithe and your giving during this time. And we understand that that's not possible for everyone. Uh, don't feel bad about that. We don't want you to feel any kind of pressure at all. But for those of you who can still keep up your giving to the church, we have two ways. You can continue to send in your offering through the mail to P.O. Box 434, Hawkinsville, Georgia 31036. And we also have the option of online giving through our church website. You can go to hawkinsvilleumc.org, and there's a giving tab up there at the top that you can click and follow. It's very easy and very simple to do, uh, and we are grateful to all of you for your continued generosity during this time. Well, today, I want to talk to you about the importance of handing down the faith. And our scripture today comes from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 2 through 7. 
at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 2 through 7. Paul says, I am writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, and I long to see you again. For I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. And this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. Amen. Well, I think I can speak for almost everyone when I say that mothers deserve a whole lot more than just one day, right? I mean, how about Mother's Week or Mother's Month? We can go with Mother's Year. How about that? That seems a lot more appropriate. Uh, Mother's Day, as we know it today, has its origins going all the way back to 1908 and a lady named Anna Jarvis when she finally succeeded in lobbying for a day to honor all mothers and to honor her own mother, Miss Ann Reeves Jarvis, who had been a nurse back in the Civil War, and she had nursed men of both sides of the war. In 1914, it became an official holiday when President Woodrow Wilson signed the proclamation designated Mother's Day to be held on the second Sunday in May as a national holiday to honor mothers. And Anna Jarvis said this, she said that it was now meant to be a day for the person who has done more for you than anyone in the world. I like that idea. A day for the person who has done more for you than anyone else in the world. I can't even fathom all that my mother has done for me. She's probably watching right now. Hi, Mom. I love you. Happy Mother's Day to you. And what's so amazing is that there is so much stuff that our mothers did for us that we don't even have a clue about. I mean, there's some stuff that we know, but there is so much more behind the scenes that they were doing for us that we did not even know. It really is amazing. The love and the care and the sacrifice and the prayers that our mothers have poured out over us. Mothers really are quite something, aren't they? I'll tell you, one of the many things, important things that I learned from my mother was the importance of having a humble but strong faith in Christ that loves to sing the praises of God rather than your own praises. My mom's faith perseveres, is optimistic about the future, believes the best in others, and I love that. And I'm still trying to grow in, in quite a few of those areas myself. The young man in our scripture knows a little something about a strong faith being handed down to him. Timothy was the Apostle Paul's co-worker and protege, and Paul is preparing to move off the scene, and Timothy is going to carry on Paul's work. And Paul here reminds Timothy of where he comes from. He reminds him of his lineage of the faith. Timothy received the faith because of his grandmother, Lois, and because of his mother, Eunice. It's kind of fascinating. Scholars believe that since Timothy's dad is never mentioned, that he was not a believer. So Timothy's grandmother and mother had the challenge of raising up Timothy in a, in a house where it might not have been well received to pass on the faith. But I'm sure to Lois and Eunice that it was worth it. The good news of Jesus was worth everything. It was too good to keep to themselves. It was so good that Timothy had to experience it as early on as possible. You see, here's what I think Lois and Eunice both knew. They knew that as Christians, that their main priority was to pass on the faith. They knew what Christian thinker Alex McManus once said, that, that the gospel comes to you 
on its way to someone else. They had received the good news. They had experienced Christ. And the natural response to that is to pass it on to someone else. The next step is to hand down the faith to the next generations. I love Lois and Eunice in this text because this is the only place where they are mentioned in Scripture. And even though we don't know anything else about them, we know that they handed down the faith to their grandson and son, Timothy. And they will forever be remembered for that. I think there's something there for all of us to hear this morning. I think this is a word for parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and, and friends of those with children and for Christians in the church who are around kids and youth on a regular basis. And that word to us is this. We all have a role to play. We all have a job. We all have a special responsibility. And that role, that job, that special responsibility is this. To hand down the faith to the next generations. That means that our number one goal as Christians is to pass on the Christian faith to those who come after us. That's it. That's the job. That's the role. That's the special responsibility for us all. And Lois and Eunice are prime examples of what that looks like in our text today. They are our role models. They are the heroes of our faith. You see, Lois and Eunice did not see their mission as trying to make Timothy into a five-star athlete in like 900 different sports. Uh, I'm glad my parents were not like some of the sports parents I saw when I was growing up at the ball fields. You know, when you're yelling at the umpire at a little league game, you need to calm down. Something has gone very wrong. You need to chill out. Uh, my parents just wanted me to have fun and enjoy whatever I was playing at the time. You know, making the next generation into sports stars, it's not our job in life. Or making the next generation into dance competition and cheer competition professionals is not our job in life. Making the next generation into super academics and straight-A students and nothing else will satisfy is not our job in life. It's not even our job to make the, the, the next generation as wildly popular as possible and just allow them to do whatever they want to do. No. Y'all, as Christian people, our number one goal, the mission, the thing we're living for, is to hand down the faith to those coming after us. That's the special responsibility that God has given to all of us. That's what really matters. That's what is truly important. And that's a job that's not meant to be outsourced to others. That's on us. All of us. Parents and grandparents and friends and church members, doctors and teachers and tutors, lawyers, firefighters, business owners. That's what we're all here for. One of the most famous Proverbs is from Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, that doesn't mean that every child will always stay on the right path no matter what. But what it does mean is that they will have a much better chance of staying on the right path if they are raised on the right path. And even if they do wander from the faith, they will have a much better chance of returning to the faith if they have that sure foundation from early on. You see, here's something I'm pretty sure of this morning. You know, if we just give lip service to Jesus, then the next generations are going to give lip service to Jesus. If we just go through the motions of being a casual Christian, then, then the next generation is just going to go through the motion of being a casual Christian. If we don't really live out our Christian faith in our daily lives, then the next generation won't really live out their Christian faith in their daily life. 
And when that happens, we won't be able to pretend about how it happened. We won't be able to be shocked and be, oh, I don't know where this is coming from. We know exactly where it's coming from. It came from us. It came from what they saw in us. Or better yet, what they did not see in us. I remember seeing an article about the influence that we can have over the next generation, uh, whether we even realize it or not. One mother said that their family was at the dinner table one night, and the youngest girl, age two, started to discipline her older brother by saying, eat your food, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, up to your room, mister. She pointed to the upstairs. The parents said that this was so funny because the child could not even count to 10 forward yet, but she had picked up that countdown backwards because of them. Another mother wrote about how her husband would always sit down at the dinner table and say something like, this looks great, or, or that meal was delicious afterwards. And one day their little girl, age four, sat down at the dinner table and she said, mmm, that was delicious. The only problem was that the food hadn't been served yet. And the mother said when the food finally did get to the table, uh, whatever it was that day, that girl took one bite and just spit it out right there and wanted no part of it whatsoever. And I guess the food really wasn't that delicious. Finally, I heard about a mother who took her kid to her daycare center one day so that she could go to work. And uh, that afternoon she came to pick him up. And she found him in the back. He was driving one of those play cars. And she found him driving around and shouting at some of the kids who were back there and looking at them and shouting, Get out of my way, you idiot. And the mother quickly realized that's a phrase that she used all the time when she was driving around town herself. And now her son had picked that up. Well, you know, whether we're parents or not, the next generation looks at us, don't they? They examine our lives. They pick up more than we know. They see how we're living. The question is, what are they seeing? What kind of example are we giving them? What do our lives say about God, Jesus, and the church, and how to treat other people? During the stay-at-home time, I've been reading through a biography of the great golfer, Tiger Woods. And it's been fascinating to read and kind of see his backstory of his family growing up. And in the book, you get to know Tiger Woods' father, Earl Woods. And it doesn't take long to realize that Earl is not a good guy whatsoever. He has one goal and one goal only, to make his son into the world's greatest modern-day professional player. Which he succeeded at. But what he didn't succeed at was giving his son Tiger any foundation whatsoever. And so, is it really any surprise to anyone that later on in Tiger's career, his whole world just came crashing down because of his terrible decisions? There was no foundation there. There was nothing there. He wasn't built upon anything. There was nothing underneath all of that drive and that will to just be the world's greatest golfer. What happens if we help our kids? What happens if we help those of the next generation to gain the whole wide world, yet they lose their souls in the process? I can very honestly say to you this morning that I don't want to be the next Earl Woods. I want to be like Lois and Eunice in our text. Passing on something of the utmost importance to the next generation. I want to be like Lois and Eunice handing down the faith to Timothy. I want to spend my life living for something that really matters and teaching others behind me about what's really important. And that should be the goal for all of us as Christian people this morning. So we ask ourselves today, what am I living for? What am I valuing as important? What am I passing down to the next generations? And I pray that God would do a new work inside of us this morning to give us a new vision of what we're living for. 
I pray that God will begin a new revival inside of us. A revival that results in us being the people who hand down the faith to the next generations. The real faith, the true faith, the powerful faith, the life-changing faith found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Famous Methodist pastor J. Ellsworth Callis once said that, that by the way we live our lives, that you or I might be the ones to put the hand of a child or young person into the hand of God. Think about that image for a second. We could be the ones who put the hand of the next generation into the hand of God. Wow. That's what so many of our mothers lived for and succeeded at when we were growing up. That's what my mom and dad did for me. That's what Lois and Eunice succeeded at with Timothy. And y'all, that's what I want to live my life for. And that's what I want you to live your life for. Because get this, there's really nothing else worth living for. Nothing else is more important than that. To paraphrase Jesus, what will it profit us if we gain the whole world, yet we don't put the next generation's hand into the hand of God? Hawkinsville first, may we all pass on the faith. May we all hand down the faith to the next generations in whatever way we can. May we all be the ones who take their hands and place it into the hand of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are so grateful for the mission and the special responsibility that we all have as Christian people. That mission, that responsibility of passing on the faith, of handing down the faith to the next generation. Lord, we pray that you will give us uh, ways to do that this week. Uh, we, we pray that you will use us in some small way to pass on the faith and to be an example to the next generation behind us. We are so thankful for those who gave the faith to us now we want to be those who give the faith to someone else. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you once again for tuning in today. And I know that God was speaking to me through that. And I hope that we all hear that message of the importance of handing down the faith to others. And uh, those are the kind of people that we want to be this week. And I encourage you to maybe find some practical way that you can start doing that this week. Maybe it's reading a Bible story with your kids at night. Maybe it's praying with your grandkids when you have a chance to talk to them. Uh, maybe you make it a point of saying the blessing at the dinner table. Or maybe you just take time to pray for the salvation of a child or a young person that you know and that you love. How can you pass on the faith to someone else this week? Well, I hope you're uh, having a blessed week and I hope that you have a great week moving forward. And go now in peace in all that you do to serve the world and to be the good news of Jesus Christ in whatever you can. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.